Tonight at 10, the Welsh Government will impose a 16-day nationwide lockdown to try to control the pandemic. In every part of Wales, from 6pm on Friday, people will be told to stay at home. The Welsh Government says it's principally to help the NHS. A fire break period is our best chance of regaining control of the virus and avoiding a much longer and much more damaging national lockdown. But in some rural areas where cases are relatively low and in the business community right across Wales, there's quite a lot of disappointment. Every time we lose turnover, we lay off people, we have to close pubs, sell pubs, the business gets smaller and weaker. We'll have the latest on why Wales is facing stricter measures than England, Scotland or Northern Ireland. Also tonight... In Dublin, the Irish government decides on the highest level of restrictions, but not a lockdown, following a surge in cases. This time around, island schools and construction sites will stay open. In Greater Manchester, there's still no agreement with government on putting the region at the highest alert level. The story of the conjoined twins from Pakistan, separated by surgeons in London, and their return home after treatment. And what inspired this musical work performed for the first time by an orchestra of young black, Asian and ethnically diverse musicians. And coming up in sport on BBC News, all to play for as Leeds United look to move third in the Premier League, but Wolves stand in their way at Ellen Road. Good evening. The Welsh Government has decided to impose a 16-day lockdown in every part of Wales to regain control of the pandemic. The First Minister, Labour's Mark Drakeford, said that without this action, the NHS in Wales would probably not be able to cope in the weeks and months ahead. But there's been dismay and some anger in those parts of Wales where the number of cases is still relatively low. Well, the lockdown there will start at 6pm on Friday evening and people will be told to stay at home unless they're key workers or can't work from home. Pubs, restaurants, hotels, all non-essential shops will close. Now, primary schools will reopen after half term, but only year seven and eight in secondary schools will be able to go back. All other pupils will be learning from home. Exercising outdoors will be permitted. Parks will stay open, as will childcare facilities, and takeaway food services will be allowed. Gatherings indoors and outdoors with people not in the same household will not be allowed. But adults who are living alone will be able to mix in their support bubble. Let's start with our Wales correspondent, Howell Griffith, who has the latest for us. Stay at home. Three words that brought life to a standstill in spring. Now an instruction for Wales in autumn. This cafe bar in Cardiff will close. The government says people must be confined to the houses again for a fortnight to stop the virus spreading. A fire break period is our best chance of regaining control of the virus and avoiding a much longer and much more damaging national lockdown. The window we have in, within which to act is only a small one. Many had anticipated the news, but it's split opinion. Dewi and Nuria are divided. Well, what concerns me is that it's blown out of all proportion, is that uh, it doesn't seem to make a blind bit of difference in these lockdowns. It has to be done, it has to be done, because I've been looking at the numbers closely, and they have gone up really quickly. Leisure, hospitality and tourism businesses will close. Elliot's the manager here. He's frustrated that in summer the government was encouraging people to go out. Now it's shutting them in again. We've had many more customers than we would have expected through August coming in uh, in a time where a virus is spreading and I think it's irresponsible on the part of the government and it's uh, led to this. Now we have to, we have to suffer after we follow the rules. Across Wales, Halloween is cancelled, bonfire night too. But while coronavirus case numbers are high here in Cardiff, over in Pembrokeshire, there are far fewer signs of a second wave and questions of a why here too they must shut down. 
I don't think it's fair that we're being locked down with the, with the rest of Wales and um, we have very low numbers. We've all been very careful in these small rural communities and we've just done everything as carefully and safely as we can. The Welsh Government warns it must act to stop hospitals from being overwhelmed. Last week, the number of COVID-related patients rose by 50%. This new intensive care unit will open in the lockdown. They desperately want to avoid cancelling elective care. Kind of preparing for the worst, you know, we've, we've dusted back off our surge plans, we've got all the spare ventilators back out of the cupboard, but I think it's with a heavy heart, um, and we kind of think we can't... Last time, we turned the whole hospital off pretty much. Every spare member of staff was brought to ITU and retrained. Well, they're busy now, they're busy in theatres doing operations. We don't have that luxury again. Businesses will need a lifeline too. This brewery has 160 pubs, but they didn't all survive the first lockdown. A lot of beer has just gone down the drain. You know, tragically, about 100 people have lost their jobs. Now the boss is worried this short, sharp shutdown may be followed by several more. This is like sharpening a pencil. If you keep sharpening the pencil, in the end, there's nothing left. You know, you can't just keep chipping away at an industry, knocking it down, expecting it to get back up again in, you know, in great shape. You know, every time we lose turnover, we lay off people, we have to close pubs, sell pubs, the business gets smaller and weaker. And that will be not just us, it will be affecting everybody in this sector. A fire break can only slow, not extinguish the danger. Lives and livelihoods depend on its success. We'll talk to Howell again in a moment. Uh, just to recap, the new lockdown measures will come into force across Wales uh, on Friday evening at six o'clock. And if we compare infection rates in Wales with the other home nations, the figures for last week look like this. They show that Northern Ireland was in fact the worst affected with 385 cases per 100,000 people, followed by England and Scotland and then Wales, with the lowest rate. So with those figures in mind, let's go back to Cardiff and talk to Howell. Um, given that Wales is number four on that list, Howell, um, what is the Welsh Government's uh, logic and rationale for this uh, action that they're now taking? Well, they would argue that that is actually a symptom of their success, or at least an indicator that their very, very cautious approach is slowing things down slightly more within Wales. You remember back in the summer, bars and pubs and restaurants op opened much later here than across the border in England. Likewise, shops were slower to open. Travel restrictions were in place for longer in Wales than other parts of the UK. So it's an abundance of caution uh, that informs you about the Welsh approach and why Wales is the first to go back into a full lockdown. Now, while the Welsh Labour government can choose its own measures, it can't fund this fire break alone. And there is this evening Still some tension between the Welsh Labour government and the Treasury. Now, the fortnight covers two months and two different job support schemes, the old furlough and the new one in November. We understand the Welsh government wanted the Treasury to fast-forward the new one to make it easier for businesses, but the rules will stay in place. And that, according to the Welsh Labour government, does create room for confusion and maybe a crack for some companies to fall down. It's pledging £300 million of its own money to help support businesses but many here are very worried, not just about the next two weeks, but for the next few months, and the fear that this may be the first of many lock, uh, mini lockdowns to come. Howell, many thanks again. Howell Griffith there for us at the Senate in uh, Cardiff Bay. Now then, in Dublin, uh, the Irish government has tonight decided to impose the highest level of restrictions across the entire country for the next six weeks. Measures to ban households mixing and to close non-essential businesses will come in at midnight on Wednesday after a surge in cases over the uh, past two weeks. Let's go live to Dublin for the latest with our Ireland correspondent, Emma Vardy. Well, in a couple of days' time, life across Ireland will revert to much the same way it was when the pandemic first took hold. Although this time around, Ireland's schools and its construction sites uh, will stay open, but all those non-essential businesses, non-essential shops will once again have to close their doors. Now, cases of the virus in Ireland have risen rapidly over the past two weeks. Almost a quarter of coronavirus cases across the whole pandemic have been recorded over that last fortnight. But the hope in the Irish government tonight is that by imposing this tougher return to lockdown measures now means there may be a return to some kind of normality towards Christmas. The arrival of a second lockdown for many is an unwelcome inevitability. What remains of Dublin's nightlife 
will soon disappear once more. This is just confusing, but like it is understandable because all the cases. Are... Also, it's kind of annoying for young people because there's no outlet for young people and we're constantly being criticised and the cases are rising, but like, <laughs> what do you expect? Why shut shops if you're not shutting schools? Like you have teachers and classrooms and they're full, like you can't social distance in them. Counties along the Irish border have been some of the worst affected as cases of the virus have climbed for a second time. For Hall, who doubles as a funeral director and shop manager in the village of Inneskeen, Good afternoon, how are you doing? The virus is feeling increasingly present. It's coming very close in the local community here. It's coming practically nearly to every house. Do you think it'll be harder this time around? Coming into the darker evenings and that, and the people are housebound, they can't get out for the walk, they can't walk the dog, they can't exercise, so they're stuck inside the house and they have no comfort or whatever. Ireland has a tiered system. This county is in tier four. People here will now have a few days to prepare before they're moved to tier five, the highest level of restrictions and close to where things were back in March. Tonight, the Irish Prime Minister announced that non-essential businesses must close across Ireland for six weeks. Restaurants, cafes and bars will be permitted to provide takeaway services only. Only essential retail may remain open. Everyone in the country has been asked to stay at home with exercise permitted within a five kilometre radius of your home. Only essential workers whose physical presence in the workplace are permitted to travel to work. Those who can work from home must do so. It comes after a wave of new restrictions in Northern Ireland began on Friday. But while the Republic of Ireland will keep schools open, Northern Ireland closed schools from today, an extra week on the half-term break. Certainly if this break was to continue beyond two weeks, I think the, the pressures that would be brought to bear would be enormous to try to see, to, can, we, can we really have to make a change for this year? Because it's just, you know, it, it, it's, it's proving to be impossible to provide those children with the level of education that they would require. In the Irish counties with the highest rates of infections, food and hospitality businesses have already shut. But the government believes these localised measures aren't working. So tonight, much more of Ireland is braced for a near total return to the lockdown of before. Emma Vardy, BBC News, Dublin. The Health Secretary for England, uh, Matt Hancock, has warned of the growing number of people over 60 in the northwest region who are becoming infected with the virus. Liverpool is badly affected, as is Greater Manchester, where local leaders are still resisting plans to put the region into the highest alert level, or Tier 3. Tonight, the Mayor of uh, Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, told the BBC that the government could have a deal uh, if it better protected low-paid people but uh, he said it was choosing not to do that. Our health correspondent Dominic Hughes has this report. Once a busy, bustling city centre, Manchester is quieter now, poised perhaps to enter the highest COVID alert level, Tier 3. Days of talks between government and local leaders have failed to resolve how and when that's to happen, while ministers warn that older people are now increasingly at risk from the virus. I'm very worried that the cases per 100,000 among the over 60s is 401 in the Liverpool city region, 241 in Lancashire and in Greater Manchester has risen from uh, over the past week from 171 to 283. Senior local health leaders acknowledge the gravity of the situation but say it's not out of control. We're not overwhelmed. I think I want people to realise that we um, it is a se serious position that we're in. Uh, we have seen a, a steady rise in our admissions, both into hospital and into intensive care, but we have very detailed escalation plans in place. In Stockport, one of ten Greater Manchester boroughs, life carries on under Tier 2 restrictions, at least for the moment, but some believe change is needed. I would like to see those restrictions coming into force and um, not just being in, in place, but being enforced um, to really try and get to grips with the, the, the pandemic and actually trying to get things back under control. But there's frustration too with the political deadlock. I wish all people in charge would start pulling in one direction. Julia wants the government to spend what's necessary. We can't let people starve. We can't let people not be able to pay their bills. 
Part of the argument in Greater Manchester is that tougher measures will have a huge economic impact but will make little difference to an infection rate that's already coming down. The latest COVID-19 infection data shows the rate in the city of Manchester continues to fall to 410 cases per 100,000 people. In Nottingham, it's 655, while in Derry and Strabane in Northern Ireland, it's 939. But in many ways, it's not the infection rate that counts, it's the number who will fall so seriously ill in the next few weeks that they end up in hospital needing intensive care. And that puts enormous pressure on a health service already under stress. Here in Greater Manchester, there are currently around about 250 critical care beds that are available, although that number could be increased quite quickly if more beds and staff become available. Now, I understand that capacity is currently running at around 85%, which is not unusual at this time of year. But ministers in London are warning that spare capacity could be wiped out within three weeks by a surge in COVID patients. And senior doctors I've spoken to say that is consistent with modelling that they've also seen. Intensive care specialists are worried about the impact on patients and a health service that's still catching up on delayed surgery and treatments. I think the added pressure of COVID infection is putting a huge strain on, on, on the system. And I think all NHS staff are extremely worried that we're in for a, a very bumpy ride over the, over the winter months. The threat remains that tougher measures could yet be imposed by ministers. There is uncertainty over what lies ahead and the two sides seem further apart than ever. That was uh, Dominic's report. Let's go live to Salford and he's there for us now. Uh, Dominic, an update tonight on the toings and froings, if you like, between government uh, and Greater Manchester local leaders. Yes, you. since we've come on air, the Community Secretary, Robert Jenrick, has told the BBC that unless a deal is reached with leaders from Greater Manchester by midday tomorrow, those Tier 3 restrictions will be imposed by government in London. Now, this comes after a day on which hopes were quite high, I think, at the start of the day, that a deal could be done. Talks were held, uh, but then an offer that the Greater Manchester team thought was on the table was withdrawn. The talks ended abruptly with no agreement and now this announcement by Robert Jenrick that those tier three restrictions will be imposed if no deal by midday tomorrow. But the big question is, I think, given the very long and loud and vocal opposition of local leaders here in Greater Manchester, led by the mayor, Andy Burnham, to the extent to which those tier three restrictions will be followed by residents, given that their local representatives have fought so hard against them. Uh, many thanks, Dominic. Once again, Dominic Hughes there with the latest in Salford. Let's take a look at the latest uh, government figures now then. They show there were 18,804 new coronavirus infections recorded in the latest 24-hour period. That means the average number of new cases reported per day in the past week is 17,649. And daily hospital admissions have risen, with 853 people being admitted on average each day over the past week, and that number does not include uh, Scotland. 80 deaths were reported. That's people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID-19 test. That means on average in the past week, 122 deaths were announced every day. And that takes the total official number of deaths so far uh, across the UK to 43,726. Now that we've uh, looked at those uh, figures, let's talk to our health editor, Hugh Pym. And some very big developments today, Hugh, not just the full lockdown in Wales. We're also talking about the real state of the virus and the pandemic in that northwest of England region. So how, do, how should you, we see things on those fronts? Well, Hugh, hospital admissions across the UK are not accelerating. In fact, the increase last week on average was a bit less than the previous week, though the underlying trend is about the same going back over three or four weeks. So, of course, all eyes on Manchester. In fact, in some parts of Greater Manchester, case numbers each day have been falling. Today, the government at Westminster came up with some forecasts. It said, based on current trends, by October the 28th, uh, all free intensive care beds in Greater Manchester, the area would be used up. Then going ahead to November the 12th, all 
the extra surge capacity which could be found, that's extra ventilators and beds, that would be used up as well on current trends. The thing is, this is a projection. It's based on a lot of different variables, how people are going to behave, how many more cases there'll be. So it's really quite hard to be sure about that. Of course, all eyes will be on these new lockdowns announced in Wales and the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland before that to see what impact it has. If you go back to March and April, when the first big lockdown was announced, it took at least three weeks to have an impact on hospital admissions and hospital numbers and start bringing them down. So it'll take time for any of this to uh, take effect. And of course, with an economic impact as well, that might affect people's well-being. Hugh, many thanks uh, once again. Hugh Pym, our health editor there with uh, his latest analysis. Now, Marwa and Safa were born in Pakistan back in 2017. Uh, they were conjoined twins, babies joined at the head. It's a very rare condition. They were later flown to London for treatment and after more than 50 hours of surgery and months of hospital care at Great Ormond Street, they were finally ready to go home. Our medical editor, Fergus Walsh, spoke to the family before they left. <laughs> Twin sisters with a special bond. It's now just over a year and a half since Safa and Marwa were separated. Back to Safa. That's it. That's good. To Marwa. They're still having physical therapy, which they clearly enjoy. But they've been through a lot to get here, and neither has emerged unscathed. The girls were born joined at the head, an extremely rare condition. They'd never seen each other's faces. The BBC followed their incredible journey as, over four months, they underwent more than 50 hours of surgery. Safa and Marwa's skull was one long tube. Their brains were misshapen and interconnected. Separating them involved a huge team at Great Ormond Street Hospital, with every stage, every stitch planned in minute detail. All of it was paid for by a private donor. Once the twins were finally separated, surgeons created a rounded skull for each of them using pieces of shared bone. Thank you. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> alhamdulillah. <laughs> for their mother Zainab, the surgeons are heroes. This, the moment she was told they'd both survived. The road to recovery has been long and progress slow. Nonetheless, Zainab was delighted to be taking them home at last. Thanks to Allah, they have got uh, very good uh, progress, especially Marwa. Uh, she only needs a little bit of support for her to take the mobility her further. And we will take uh, good care of Safa and hopefully she will start walking as well. In theatre, the surgeons had to make a near impossible choice. There's something oozing deep down there that I can't see at the moment. Only one twin could receive some key blood vessels that nourished both their brains. They were given to Marwa, the weaker twin. But as a result, Safa had a stroke. Safa now has permanent damage to her brain and may never walk. I feel Marwa has done really well and carries on making great progress, so... When I look at the whole family, yes, uh, it was probably the right thing to do for the, for the whole family. Uh, but for Safa, as an individual, I'm not so sure. It's a decision that I made as a surgeon, it's a decision that we made as a team. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it's a decision we have to live with. And does it still trouble you? Yes, very much so. I think it always will. <laughs> Both girls have learning difficulties, but the family say they have no regrets, and whatever the future holds, Marwa and Safa will face it together, as sisters and twins, but also separate individuals. Fergus Walsh, BBC News. At the public inquiry into the Manchester Arena bombing in 2017, a father who was waiting to collect his children on the night said that he'd noticed a young man in the process of lying down with a backpack on the floor next to him. Neil Hatfield told the inquiry that his immediate thought was that the man was a suicide bomber and he said he thought the police had been alerted. Our North of England correspondent Judith Morris reports. 
Bent under the weight of his rucksack, Salman Abedi arrived at Manchester Arena intent on murder. He didn't want to be seen and headed to an area not covered by CCTV. But he was spotted. Neil Hatfield was at the arena to collect his four daughters from the Ariana Grande concert. I do solemnly, sincerely. Today, Mr Hatfield told the public inquiry that he saw a man with a heavy rucksack lying down on the floor. I thought, suicide bomber, straight away, without very little doubt in my mind. It was, honestly, my heart was racing. He was dressed all in black. He looked like a terrorist. He looked like, he looked like a, how do I, I don't know how to explain it, like a Bond villain, do you know what I mean? Like a... He just had this, I just had this really bad feeling about him. And the bag, it was the bag, it was massive and it was solid. It, I thought it was a bomb, straight away. I, I just, I don't know why, I just, I just knew it in my mind. It was so, yeah, it just looked like a bomb. These officers were given commendation awards after the attack. Although Jessica Buller was newly qualified, she was the most senior officer at the arena. Today, she admitted that she'd taken an unacceptable two-hour break, missing the moment Abadi entered the foyer. Last week, the inquiry heard evidence from a merchandise officer who said she'd seen Abadi before the bomb went off and that she'd pointed him out to PC Buller. But today, the PC said she's confident that conversation didn't happen. When the bomb exploded, the British Transport Police officers were all at Victoria Station next door. When they heard the blast, they ran towards it. PC Buller was the first to reach the foyer. The training that I've had wasn't sufficient enough to deal with what I was witnessing. Um, sorry. I'm, I know you're upset, and, 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 and let me reassure you, I've got one more question after this, and then, then I'll sit down. You effectively, did you feel left in the lurch? Yes. Doing your best, but hopelessly ill-trained and prepared for it? Yes, correct. 22 adults and children were killed. This week, the public inquiry will continue to hear from people who say they saw the bomber responsible for their murders before he carried out his suicide attack. Judith Moritz, BBC News, Manchester. The latest picture of China's strength uh, shows that the economy grew by 4.9% in the past three months, another sign of how effectively it has brought coronavirus under control. By comparison, the US is struggling, a prominent theme in the presidential campaign right now, with the widening gap in performance predicted to fuel growing hostility uh, in America towards Beijing. As our China correspondent John Sudworth explains, America's troubles are taken as proof in China that something more fundamental is at stake in the US election than just a choice between two candidates. China has conquered COVID its way. Normality restored with barely a murmur of public debate and, of course, not a single vote for or against the leaders who've delivered it. State propaganda drives the message home, with Americans voting amid protests and a still uncontrolled pandemic. Democracy is presented not as an alternative, but a disaster. The virus has widened a growing gulf between the US and China, and Christian G is one of the casualties. He had his U.S. visa temporarily revoked by a U.S. administration that now sees Chinese students as potential spies. I worry it might happen again, he says, telling me he's now thinking of studying in the U.K. instead. Who do you want to win the election, Trump or Biden? Of course Biden. And you might think this man would agree, despite the initial warmth. My feeling toward you is an incredibly warm one, as we said. Within months of this meeting, relations were in the deep freeze. But it's not just Donald Trump who's come to view China's system as a threat. It's this system that now lies at the heart of one of the defining ideological rivalries of our time. China will know that if Joe Biden wins, he may be more effective than his predecessor at building coalitions with like-minded allies against it.
the Communist Party's initial cover-up of the virus, its incarceration of minorities and its tightening grip on Hong Kong means Trump or Biden, the US-China rift is likely to widen. And over trade too. The Beijing car show, more proof of the success of China's draconian lockdowns and mass virus testing, is also a demonstration of the country's rising economic power. This Chinese car costs £65,000. Some analysts believe Trump is actually giving China an advantage. Trump or Biden? Well, if you ask me for the China's own interests, I uh, will uh, prefer have uh, uh, Trump there rather than the, uh, uh, Biden. Seem to me Trump will undermine the U.S. much more than uh, cause trouble to China. No, Biden, look, Biden is gone. In the chaos of the U.S. COVID election, China sees the possibility of an unlikely winner, Xi Jinping, and signs of a long-anticipated U.S. decline. John Sudworth, BBC News, Beijing. Britain's first mainly black, Asian and ethnically diverse orchestra, called Chineke, has tonight performed the world premiere of a work inspired by a black demonstrator who came to the aid of a white protester during a Black Lives Matter protest earlier this year. And the image of Patrick Hutchinson's act of kindness outside the Royal Festival Hall in London went viral on social media. Our arts editor, Will Gompert, went to the dress rehearsal. I'll stare at this image numerous times. My eyelids will pull and plead to blink to quell this heat slowly rising. It takes you somewhere. It allows you time to breathe. It allows a, a, some truths to come out. Like the same programmes every festive season. This is Remnants, a new piece of music and poetry, watched for the first time by Patrick Hutchinson, the man who inspired it for the action he took in June when he carried a counter-protester to safety from a Black Lives Matter demonstration in London. Can you relate what happened here with what you've just heard in there? Yes, I can. With the combination of the spoken word with the powerful music, 100%. Um, on the day, if you were there amongst the melee, it was hectic, there was a lot of confusion, there was a lot of, there was a mixture of, of love and hate because there were people trying to protect him but there were also people who, were, who wanted harm to come to him. And you know, that resonates really a lot with what happened inside there. I, I, I felt, I really felt it. The history of black composers in what we call classical music has really been forgotten, but I think there is a real hunger in this industry to kind of right that wrong and to also welcome everybody um, into the world that, of classical music. I had this, the, the sort of hairs went up on the back of my neck because I knew this was a piece to be reckoned with. It's got such dynamism and such angst and passion in it that it, it, it just took flight. I knew we were in for something very magical and very special. I'll laugh at the joy of the hero's children. Remnants is not so much a celebration of an act of kindness, more an invitation to ask the questions that arise from it about representation, social anxiety and equality. It is very much of and about the world today. Will Gompertz, BBC News. And that's it. Now, BBC One, it's time for the news where you are. Have a good night.